So uh, most of you know I almost never speak with notes, but when you tell me to speak for 15 minutes, I need notes. So, um, so uh, okay, great. So, and I think I have a thing here. Okay. So, um, I, 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 we, we've already talked about unconscious bias, so this is a crowd that already knows about bias. So, um, good. That's a good place to start. I'm not going to spend too much defining it, but I am going to throw more, a, f a few more examples at you so I can drill it home, because I want what you all to see is that every single one of you, women, men, enlightened and unenlightened, are doing things that are affecting uh, the opportunities for women and under other underrepresented groups at work. I do it, you do it, we all do it. And so um, this is your call to action talk. It's right before lunch, so um, I'm trying to keep you awake. Um, but it, it is not a thing that you can do by just being aware of it. That's Anne, the only thing I disagreed with your talk. Living the good life is not enough. Um, because I certainly lived the good life, and it's not enough. So um, I'm going to give you some examples of what's happening. So you know, we're told a lot of stuff in the media. Women don't ask. They ask too much. They ask the wrong way. Um, we think too much about our children, we're not maternal enough in the workplace, we're too assertive, we're not assertive enough. When we're assertive, we're like Hillary Clinton. Our voices are too high-pitched, we talk too much at meetings, Anne showed some of those great data. Um, we lack self-confidence, we all have imposter syndrome, we're not really good at science, we certainly can't do math, although the data disregard that. Um, we don't golf, you know, whatever the problem is. <laughs> Um, we have a lot of problems, and you know, here's uh, Evelyn Murphy's pay, some page. This is science pay pay and equity data. It's international. It doesn't just apply in our case to full time. It applies to everybody. Um, and our bigger problem in science is this, especially for women, um, especially women for underrepresented women themselves, and then if you are in a racial minority, you are doubly penalized by the leaky pipeline. Um, so there's some data to show that. Um, how does this make sense? We're so liberal-minded in science. Anybody you ask is going to say that this is wrong. I have a daughter. She should make the same as the men, you know. And I, we have educated children, and those children are in college. How does this make sense? That's why I need every one of you to own this problem, that this is not something that somebody else is doing. So there's still a huge number, a disparity of women in leadership roles. This is happening in industry, too. Um, we used to attribute this to the pipeline, actually. So if you look at the pipeline. But the problem is that the pipeline has been, for decades, especially in life sciences, more women than men. So we cannot blame the pipeline anymore. In fact, um, AWIS in the 80s, there wasn't a Boston AWIS chapter in the 80s which folded. Why? Because we were done. We had equity. It was all fair. Um, no more problems for women. And, and I actually have spoken to some of the historical founders of the chapter. We refounded the chapter in the middle of the 90s because we were clearly not done. And so, um, you know, it's no longer the pipeline. AWIS, National AWIS, does not talk about the pipeline anymore. So this recent headline from the Boston Business Journal, like whoop de doo 43% women on the board of Juniper, which is a women's health biotech. Okay, I was not so excited, okay. The next closest is 11, led by the amazing Abby Selmaker, who's a biotech uh, luminary in the community. 30% women on her board. All I can say is shame on her, and I yell at her about this all the time. Um, most, the most diverse large company in Boston is Boston Scientific. They have 40% women in their leadership, uh, on their board. So this isn't even looking at the leadership roles. And I'm working with many large companies, Vertex, Novartis included, um, just because you called it out, um, where the, leak, the pipeline is leaking, is gushing, not doing well at all. Gushing, okay. So um, why is this still news, right? It's not that exciting. Um, so. Um, I'm just going to, in case anyone didn't see this, this is one of my favorite overt. This is not unconscious bias. This is conscious bias. And these ones are a little easier to work on. So this guy, Daryl Mastropieri, was Facebook friends with many of the women in his lab, all of the people in his lab, in fact. They're a very tight lab. He's a guy. He was at the uh, neuroscience conference, and what he said was, my impressions of the conference of the Society for Neuroscience in New Orleans. There are thousands of people at the conference and an unusually high concentration of unattractive women. This is an actual clip from his Facebook page. The supermodel types are completely absent. What's going on? Are unattractive women particularly attracted to neuroscience? Are beautiful women particularly uninterested in the brain? No offense to anyone. OK. So somebody said something, and he took it down, but not. This is the social media. Hello, my friend. So this was clipped first. 
So can you imagine a lab head, any lab head, saying, wow, you know, all the men here at this conference are, goos are loser geeks. They have body odor, dowdy clothes. They're a little slow in their maternal instincts, maybe. <laughs> and most of them haven't shaved in days. Where are the hunks? Are you kidding? This would just not happen, OK? So this blatant sexism was not the problem, because there was a huge outcry online. And you know, it doesn't solve the problem. But I will tell you some bad news. He is still at the University of Chicago, employed, fully employed, and has a lab. He still has 50% women in his lab. Vote with your feet. Why would any woman work for that man? I don't know. Okay. So, um, and, and uh, you know, this is one of my favorite slides as well, right? So, um, another one I got from Ben Bars. So, um, implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious matter. And so, like I said, I have been saying the words women and science together my whole life, and I still hold the same biases that you do, and I'll give you some examples of how I watch that happening in my own life, and I want you to do a little self-examination as well. Okay, so um, why is this all important? So, um, okay, I just want to make sure I'm keeping up. So this is kind of an interesting, um, hmm. Okay, so um, we, I want to also give an example of bias that is not uh, female gender associated, because this is another thing that's harming uh, just the whole milieu of the workplace. So um, my, my son, when he was about four, walked into a door at school and needed some stitches in his forehead. And my kids were in uh, daycare near my husband on Hanscom Air Force Base, and I was in Worcester working at Abbott. And so, and it was of course Friday afternoon, and I keep Sabbath, I'm Jewish. It always happens Friday afternoon. So Friday afternoon, he calls me and he says, Ben needs a few stitches. The doctor says they can do it in the office in the Longwood area. You better go home and get ready for Sabbath, and I will take the kids to the doctor and get the stitches in Ben's head. And I'm like, see at home, because frankly, in our family, my husband's the maternal one. So um, he takes Ben to the doctor, and he walks in, and the male doctor walks in, and he puts his gloves on, and he says, where's this child's mother? And my husband said, uh, and this is, by the way, legendary at the doctor still. The nurses still talk about this. My husband says, I'm this child's father. And the doctor says, I can't put stitches in the child's head if the mother is not present. <laughs> this is true. This is 24, 20 years ago, 20 years ago. So, um, you know, my husband turned 100 shades of red and was about to haul off. And the doctor and said, I am not going to the children's hospital emergency room Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock with two children. You are going to put these stitches in this child's head. The doctor says, well, if he freaks out, I'm sending you away because I am not going to do it if he freaks out, you know. And my husband's like, so they lay Ben down, and he puts the anesthesia on, and uh, my, my, son, my husband turns to my son, who he knows very well, and says, Ben, the doctor's going to put a little medicine on your forehead so you won't feel it, but he's going to sew up the hole in your head like mommy sews up a hole in a shirt, because he doesn't sew, that is true. Um, and, um, you know, you're going to be all fine. And the doctor said, don't tell him that, you'll scare him. As if my husband did not know that his own child was an information-needing child right, that what could calm him is if this stranger, who we had never worked with before, could actually tell the parent of this child what was right for him. Fortunately, Ben reached up and said, oh, doctor, don't worry. If I lose a little blood, my body will make more. <laughs> so this is, a this is a totally true story, but this is a huge problem. So Richard Gallagher in 2008 at The Scientist, I noticed, and I don't know if anybody else, noticed his editorial saying, wow, shame on us at The Scientist. We don't have any women in our advisory board. How did that happen? I have daughters. I have a wife. I'm a diversity-minded person. His quote was, there are precisely three out of 22. At 14%, I am in Harvard Medical School territory. This was in 2008. That's hardly the ideal position from which to criticize the NIH, which was my original intention. NIH reaches the giddy heights of 20% women among its senior scientists. So he was about to write an editorial on diversity, counted his own house, and said, whoa, I, I'm shame on me. Okay, so I went to look again at the scientist. It's now 2016, and the advisory board list was gone from the website and the magazine. So I called my friend at the scientist, and I said, what's up? And she said, well, you know what? There's still no women, so we're revamping it. We took it down. <laughs> eight years later, eight years later, okay? There are, however, um, a senior woman editor. Four out of five editors are women. The only man on staff is the office admin, which I really liked. So, okay, so um, 
the subtle and insidious influence of biases is that we all do it. And so I'm going to do a little bit of data, but I'm assuming that many of you have already seen these important data, and if not, you should familiarize yourself. So um, this was an app, uh, a, a study that was done with a very quite large N, where um, they looked at um, gender bias among science faculty and academia. You can see these faculty were given resumes to look at, and the only thing different on the resume was the name. Was it Jane or John? You know, and so and they were asked a bunch of qualitative questions um, about how much they would uh, hire this person, how much, how how reliable were they? And every single time, the boy, you know, there were statistically significant differences. The male applicant was more qualified. They would give him a higher salary. They suggested the salary, the starting salary would be higher. The mentoring, their advice, they were more eager to give advice and to mentor. And it didn't matter if you divided this into men or women faculty; it was equal numbers. Everybody did it. Okay, so um, this is such a powerful thing that we are all doing it. We don't do it on purpose, but we do it. So how is this happening? Language in our society is having a big effect on bias. That's why I talked about to Milka about it happening from birth, calling our daughters bossy, calling our boys playful, you know, like the different adjectives that we use. So this bugs me. This continues to bug me. Fellow, postdoctoral fellow, that's a boy word. Okay, can't we call them laureates? Can't we call them something else? Um, and it's a big honor to become a fellow. It's a boy word, right? But we don't even notice anymore the, how insidious these little things are in commercials. It's, it's just ever present, right? So we hear this language from birth. And you know, what I'm asking you to do is call it out. So when I was at, uh, working at a, a locally large pharmaceutical company, I don't want to badmouth anybody, um, there, one of the greatest things to happen to pharmaceutical companies is to be named a project leader. If you thought of a project and you got it off the ground, and at my company, a big email would go out saying why you, how you got it off the ground and naming you as the project leader. And so we had no female project leaders at the company I was at. And I had started three projects, and I was about to become the coordinator of one of them. And I was not named a project leader, I was named a coordinator, because I was coordinating a collaborative project with an outside organization, but it was quite a large project. It had all the same kinds of milestones and goals and monetary responsibilities, and no email went out, and I just became the coordinator of this large project, and it was never announced. And I'm having lunch with another female friend of mine, and she tells me, oh, I'm going to be the coordinator of this new antibody project. And I said, what the? The coordinator? What is that? She goes, I know that's what they told me. I go, is there going to be an email? She goes, it happened last week, no email. I'm like, so we, we were like, okay, I think we need to say something. So we marched into the office of the CEO and we said, you lost the opportunity to name your first two female project leaders. Like, what is that about? And he's like, oh, I'm really sorry, we just didn't think, you know. So uh, what is that, right? This is happening in such an insidious and serious way that I bet you can all think of examples if you really pull it where you can think of it. All right, so um, this is a thing about words, this Trix and Pisenka study. I suggest you look it up. I'm going to skip it a little bit because I want to make sure I'm somewhat on time. Um, what hap what's happening here is people are writing recommendations for men that talk about how smart and productive they are and about for women that say they try hard and they're team players. So who are you going to hire? The one who tries hard and, as a scientist, the one who tries hard and is a good mentor? and likes a family woman, or the person who's productive gets grants and is brilliant, right? So um, I went and looked at my recommendation letters, and so um, after I read this study for the first time, this is a little bit of an older study, and I was like, what the heck? I am so careful when I write recommendation letters now to stick to science, professional, action words for everybody. Even some of my dear friends who I know are fantastic mentors and warm and, you know, go the extra mile, I avoid any wording that talks about effort or, or trying hard, right? Because those insidious words get in when you're reading a recommendation. So just taking care in how you write a recommendation can make a difference in how people's careers can be affected. Okay. Um. Okay, so, um, two minutes, okay, so um, I'm not going to go into the details of gender bias bingo or the implicit um, association test. Um, so um, the implicit bias was kind of put into numbers by Banerjee, uh, Mazarin Banerjee at Harvard, and if you've ever seen her speak, she does this test on the board. She can do it with a room full of 200 women scientists, and they're still biased 
toward men and science and women and liberal arts. It is a frightening thing to watch. Um, and so I tell you to look it up online, the IAT, the Implicit Association Test. After so many years of being in AWIS, I have a freak, freaky association with women in science. Yay for me. I totally failed the ageism Implicit Association Test, <laughs> and I'm 52. Okay, so um, and I took it again recently, still failed. Okay, so um, I, I suggest that you test out your own uh, weaknesses there. Um, but reproduction, the problem with reproduction is that we don't have the same role, women and men. Women carry the baby, and this leads to all sorts of biases um, and, and assumptions by people. Um, so really important. Okay, so the call to action. Um, say something, see something, say something, right? We can't allow, why is this important? Why did this get so blown out of proportion? It got blown out of proportion because it's not okay for leaders to get up in front of the scientific community and say things that are sexist because words matter, they create bias, they emphasize bias, and they make us more biased. So this guy says, when you fall in love with them, they fall in love with you, this is women in the lab, and when you criticize them, they cry. So I want to give you a little more backstory on that. This guy was married, fell in love with a tech, got divorced and married her, by the way. Um, and, and she stuck by him the whole time. But when asked whether he was joking or serious about this, he stuck to his guns and says, no, nope, I really think there's a problem. I think men, women are distracting in the lab. I'm just telling the truth, okay? So that's not really okay. There was a backlash. We won't talk about that now. I'm happy to send you articles if you want to get head up about this as well. So what are we going to do about it? So, oh yeah, this had a nice, again, overt, overt, so overt sexism gets this kind of response. This one says, mixed gender lab, no falling in love or crying permitted, okay? So, um, but again, these are overt examples of bias, and I didn't even talk about overt examples of sexual harassment and the silence that goes on and the complicity that goes on there. Um, a huge other problem in disturbing the progression of women through the pipeline. So what can we do? Number one, and I, I know I need one more minute, I'm, I'm going to go quick. I'm not going to read these slides, but one thing is you have to do is structure processes for success. In your workplaces, you need to change the way you do things so that interviewing and promotion are fair and equitable. And th these are some of the recommendations. AWIS has a book and a report on this, so I'm happy to share with you. Um, for a it focused on academics, and there's a lot of advice about how to do this from Google in non-academic settings, actually. They're big uh, leaders in that area. So um, you've heard about the you know, tryouts for the symphony where they put a screen up so that they can't see the people and it makes a huge difference, right? We can't do that with science so well if you need to see someone's publications, but make people justify their decisions, right? Look at accomplishments, make, the, make it very black and white as you can. Second thing, collect data. So um, you know, this is collecting data on you, on what's going on in your company. So at Google, they did a study where they asked, if you, if you give the contributions of a project to individuals, it always looks like, um, it looks more equal. But if you con attribute contributions to a male-woman team, and then you say, which, who did more work? Everybody thinks the man did more work, right? So you have to be very careful about giving credit where credit is due, especially in the case of underrepresented groups like women and racial minorities. Another thing is to evaluate subtle messages. So I can't emphasize this enough. This is this language issue again. So here's a study done. They sent people into a mall, and one person wore a hat that said Texan and proud, and the other person wore a hat that said gay and proud. And they measured the help and the number of minutes that people would engage and talk with them pleasantly, um, and the level of engagement. And you can see that if you're gay and proud, and, you know, and this was in Texas, so not here in Boston, um, you know, there was just a re much reduced interaction, perceived negativity was higher, okay? So any little tiny things are happening to make people feel uncomfortable, unwelcome, and you know this is happening in laboratories, you know this is happening at conferences, you know this is happening in the scientific community. Um, finally, hold everyone accountable. So um, if you hear people talk that way, I know it sounds nitpicky, but you need to speak out. You need to make sure, make it unacceptable in your workplaces for people to talk. Even sometimes joking is not okay if it makes people feel uncomfortable and sets the wrong tone. Um, and there are some great um, AWIS webinars on how to counteract language um, without sounding like shrill or a harpy or whiny or any of those things. Um, but it's really important that we all speak out. And of course, it's women and men that need to do this because men have daughters. Um, they want to see the world change as well. This cannot just be something that's driven by one of our genders or one group of that's a minority. So um, 
Empower everyone in your workplaces to call out bias, reward them when they do it. Um, and I have to say that intention and training will go nowhere if we don't make it a part of every day. So thanks very much.